Excellent. Well, thanks again. Um, there's a lot in, of course, I hope you're appreciating that Luke is very dense and there's a lot in every statement and even a lot in particular words. That's the case with all the Gospels if we do a serious Bible study. Um, remember, we're not doing this to learn about Luke. Luke didn't write this so that we learn about Luke. Luke wrote this so we, more, we learn more about Jesus Christ. That's, I said that in the beginning of the first, first session, beginning of the second session, beginning of this session, and I'll say it again at the beginning of next session. Okay? That's our primary aim. This is not just an intellectual exercise. This is for the sake of something much higher. All right? To know and love Jesus Christ more and live out his life in our own lives better each day. All right, so we're starting with chapter two. In those days. Now, when Luke says in those days, it's any length of time in this period, right? He's not intending to be precise, and we don't necessarily know exactly how many days or months this those days actually extend over. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Who's Caesar Augustus? Caesar, this Caesar is the grand nephew of the original Caesar, Julius Caesar. Everyone's heard of Julius Caesar. You can actually go to the place in Rome where he was assassinated, right? Um, and most people who know anything about Roman history have heard about Augustus Caesar. He is the first emperor of the Roman Empire. And his reign was from 31 BC to AD 14. So a very long period. Now, interesting though, an interesting coincidence, and I haven't heard anyone comment on this, is that the true God-man, Jesus Christ, comes into the world at the same time we have the beginning of the Roman emperors and the Roman imperial cult the cult that elevated the Roman emperors to be divine, the cult that designated the Roman emperors to be the son of Jupiter or the son of the chief god. It's interesting, isn't it? And so we'll be, they will begin with the birth of Christ, the great struggle over the next three centuries plus between the followers of the true God man, Jesus Christ, and the followers of the false God men, the Roman emperors. And we see who eventually triumphed in that great struggle. A decree went out from Caesar Augusta that the, all the world should be enrolled. Well, the critics, there are many very skeptical critics who say, well, there's a, there's a red light flashing Luke is false. Luke is wrong. There was never any such worldwide censuses, if that's the word, censi, uh, ever issued by Augustus Caesar. No, emphatically to the contrary. We know as a fact from Egyptian papyri, you know, manuscripts left over from Egypt, that the Romans conducted regular, a regular census for... Roman citizens basically every 20 years. So we have it, we have it recorded in the days of Augustus that we had, we had a census for Roman citizens, 28 BC, 8 BC, and roughly around AD 20 after in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And we also had a census conducted for non-Roman citizens every 14 years. And the first one was in 8 BC. And the next one was in AD 56. And we have a record of these censuses that were conducted for non-Roman citizens right through to the mid third century AD. So we have a coincidence in 8 BC, we have a census by Augustus Caesar for Roman citizens and non-Roman citizens at the same time. Was 
the Holy Family, Our Lady and St. Joseph, responding to one of the, this census of 8 BC. Probably not. Not if Jesus is born 3 or 2 BC. The experts who delve into this from a Catholic perspective say that what this census of Augustus was an extraordinary one outside of this 14-year cycle. These censuses that were conducted every 20 years for citizens or every 14 years for non-citizens were for purposes of taxation. Some people believe, the majority of commentators believe that this census was also for the sake of taxation, but other commentators say no, it was a different one. And we get clues of, about that from even the writings of Augustus. This was a census to compel everyone in the empire to accept Augustus Caesar as the first citizen of the empire, the father of everyone in the empire. It was a census to get everyone's allegiance to Augustus Caesar as the head of the empire. Now, would that have compromised the faith of St. Joseph and the Virgin Mary obeying this decree and going to Bethlehem to register and giving allegiance to the Roman Emperor? No, if, it, if, if this did not require assenting to the divinity or the divine genius of Caesar Augustus. And Jesus would say decades later, you can give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, taxes, you know, civil obedience to just laws, etc. But if Caesar's asking for divine honors, well, that's where we draw the line. And it's doubtful that Caesar, uh, in this case, when he was asking everyone to acknowledge him as the father of everyone in the empire, was asking for a divine title. All right. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, that's another lights flashing here. I've attended a lecture at Sydney University where this expert was trying to debunk Luke outright, as many have tried to just trash Luke's gospel on that very sentence, that it's non-historical, that it's anti-historical. Let's place the birth of Jesus anywhere you like in B.C., 1 BC, 2, 3, even up to 6 BC. Say Jesus is born somewhere in that period. Well, the experts tell us that Quirinius was not governor of Syria in that period. He was governor of Syria, AD 6 onwards. So we have an historical error here from Luke. Well, is it that obvious? The answer, the answer is a bit complex. So bear with my, me, give me, have patience here with my answer. The word here for governor is actually hegemon in Greek. We well, got that equivalent English word hegemony, which means to have power over someone. If I've got hegemony over you, I've got power over you. So to translate hegemon as governor is, is one translation, but not the univocal one, not the exclusive one. It just meant that Quirinius had power over Syria in this period, but what type of power was it? And by the way, under, if you understand Roman government in this part of the world, Syria was an imperial province. And the, the governor of Syria was appointed directly by the Roman emperor because Syria was important as a frontline province against the Parthian Empire, all right? Other provinces were senatorial where the governors were appointed by the Senate and not the Roman emperor. It was a power sharing arrangement, okay? So the legate, that is the person appointed by Augustus to run Syria also had jurisdiction over the Holy Land, Judea. So Pontius Pilate, when he was governor of Judea, he was not governor. That's the mistranslation. He was procurator of Judea, subject to the governor in Syria. It was only later, after the Jewish revolt, AD 66 to 70, that the Romans appointed a separate governor to govern the troublesome Jews directly. All right. Now, the probable answer, there's two answers here. 
One answer, which is a good answer, according to some historical sources, is that Quirinius was actually governor twice of Syria. In BC times, when this census was issued, and then later AD 6 onwards. That's one possible answer. The more probable answer is that we get this clue from Tertullian's writing that the governor of the person who had hegemony over Judea when this census was issued was actually Sentius Saturninus. And he was governor of Syria as well and they had jurisdiction over Judea. But his military commander in BC times was Quirinius. And we have his full name from other sources. And it was Quirinius as the governor, military commander of the Roman army in that part of the world, who was given responsibility for rolling out that census that St. Joseph and Our Lady obeyed and fulfilled. Later on, in AD 6, Quirinius gets a promotion from being military commander to governor of Syria. Okay, so it's... It's okay for Luke to say that he was governor of Syria because he had authority in Syria and over Judea as the military commander of, at that time. Now, this was the first enrollment which corresponds to that period after 8 BC. He says first enrollment to distinguish the second enrollment in AD 5-6, which was caused a Jewish revolt against the Romans, and that's referred to in the writings of Josephus and in Luke, uh, Acts of the Apostles, right? It's referred to there, the revolt that occurred uh, against that Roman second enrollment in AD 6. Now, all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. So... Why does Joseph go move from Nazareth to Bethlehem? There were many Jews living in Galilee. That is, many people originally from Judea who moved north into Galilee. One of them was Joseph and the family of the Virgin Mary. But Joseph, now the head of this family, because now at this time, Joseph and Mary have moved from betrothal to formal marriage though St. Luke still uses the word betrothal, as we'll see later on, because they have to be formally married if they're going to travel together, live under the same roof, okay, even though they stay separate sexually, etc. Probably Joseph was born in Bethlehem, owned property in Bethlehem, and in his own mind considered Bethlehem to be his true home and ultimately lived there which is why they go to Bethlehem to register. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed. All right, most of that we know. And of course, why is Luke is giving us this material? Because again, he's reinforcing a critical messianic precondition. If Jesus is going to be the Messiah, he has to be of the house of David. That's why Luke is emphasizing that Joseph was of the house of David and that to satisfy the prophecy in Micah, one of the minor prophets, this prophecy, Bethlehem Ephrata, thou art a little one among the thousands of Judah, but out of thee is to come he who is to shepherd my people Israel. So that prophecy and the Pharisees and the scribes, they were aware of that prophecy acutely. They believed that when the Messiah comes, he would be of the house of David and born in Bethlehem, which is why Luke is giving us this detail here. Bethlehem, by the way, means house of bread. And there's a significance in that. And you notice here in verse 5, that uh, Luke is still saying that Joseph is traveling with Mary, his betrothed. He's using the technical word, betrothed. He's not calling Mary Joseph's wife, but they are now legally husband and wife. Because I tell you, the culture then, you can't travel with a man side by side anywhere publicly 
in a long journey like this one from Nazareth to Bethlehem over 140 kilometers, seven days, 10 days, 14 day journey, unless they are married. But Luke is using betrothed here deliberately as a signal to his readers that they are, yeah, married, but it's not consummated, right? And it's going to stay not consummated. Who was with child? Mary, who was with child. Now, and while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. So while they were there, the impression is that they arrive at Bethlehem and it's only a couple of days later, a few days later, that Mary's delivery is to take place. So what, what's happened here is that Augustus has issued a decree and unwillingly rolled out the divine plan, one prophesied back in the time of Micah, you know, five, five to 600 years earlier, that this pagan emperor who assumes eventually his own divine status unwittingly fulfills the will and designs of the one true god right and it's because of his decree that the prophecy of micah is fulfilled and she gave birth to her firstborn son now firstborn son some people read that and they think ah this was mary's first implying that it's first of many and we had a heretic in the days of the 4th century AD named Helvidius, who would seize on this term and from it infer that, well, Jesus was the firstborn son, and therefore that implies first of many. So Mary, Jesus had brothers and sisters, of course, born of Mary and Joseph. And so this Catholic dogma that Mary was a virgin, a perpetual virgin, is another one of those Catholic heresies. All right, well... To be realistic, I mean, we can defend Mary's perpetual virginity quite easily, but we haven't got the time to do it now. But firstborn son is a legal title to the child who is firstborn, irrespective of how many children were born afterwards. And as firstborn, you had special rights and privileges under the law, particularly with respect to the family name and inheritance, etc. So Jesus is the firstborn son and he's called firstborn when there's no one else born yet. As soon as he's born, he's called firstborn. And he would stay as a firstborn, irrespective of any brothers and sisters are come afterwards from the same parents. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Uh, if you saw a baby wrapped up in swaddling clothes in those days, you'd probably be a little bit bewildered because they wrapped the child very tight and it was a child was completely bundled up so the child couldn't move their arms and legs so it was wrapped like a mummy okay right up to the neck all right uh, i haven't seen anyone do that these days and laid him in a manger now this is all given in detail because the angel's going to give instructions to the shepherds in the same detail okay born wrapped in swaddling clothes placed in the manger and if you're reading this at, 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 in this time in this culture you think well gosh how lowly was that because the manger was a food trough for animals children are not normally born and laid in such a circumstance right and what we're getting here what commentators would say in subsequent centuries is that this imagery is important in that Jesus is in a food trough for animals. He's born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, and he is going to be the bread that will feed us. Okay, the bread from heaven, which is placed now in a manger for animals, but will be a placed in another type of manger or the tabernacle or whatever for the followers of Christ in the centuries to come because there was no place for them in the inn we all know that because the Bethlehem was flooded with you know other Jews who were obeying the same decree and registering in in Bethlehem to give their allegiance to Augustus Caesar, yes. Um, this is your uh, this explanation about the trump relating to the word of Bethlehem? House of bread. Yes, it does. Bethlehem, house of bread. 
Jesus is our bread, and he's put his place in a uh, in a, this manger, which is what animals eat from. They eat their food from that. And Jesus is going to be food for us. He's going to be that heavenly bread for us. Okay? So the name, the name Bethlehem, is that given as a, the prophet? Is it intentionally from prior to I have to look into it. I'll be very honest with you. I don't know the origins of the word, who named it or why, but we know its meaning and we know that it was a city of David and, you know, Jesus is of the house of David. He's the ultimate king. The house of David now is completely dispossessed, disempowered. Um, it is the royal family of Judah. It still is now. The Virgin Mary is a princess to become a queen in that royal house. She becomes a queen as soon as Jesus is born. Because Jesus is the ultimate king in the line of the house of David. Joseph is of the house of David. So in a sense... He is a prince in the house of David. The house of David has been out of power since August 587 BC. It's a long time. It's nearly 600 years. In power now are anyone but the house of David. The Herodians are not even Jews, let alone of the house of David. The Maccabees were um, in the time, in the that period of the wars in the second century BC, when they re-established hegemony over the, you know, the original territories and etc. When they were powerful, there was this restoration. Well, they weren't Davidic. They were a royal family, but they weren't Davidic. Okay. Um, so who's in power now? We've got Augustus. We've got the, you know, the governor of Syria. Uh, there's a legate of Augustus. We've got a procurator in Judea, subject to the legate in Syria. And you've got the Herodians, and none of them are Jews, and none of them, you've got to be not just a Jew, you've got to be of the house of David, okay? Um, now, who's got a Bible here? Go to Isaiah 66, 7. Go, I'm going to ask someone to read it out loud. Isaiah 66, 7. I'll see if I can get there before you. Isaiah 66, 7. Right, here I am. Who's got it first? Put your hand up. All right, our friend here again. All right, now with a loud voice, I want you to read Isaiah 66, 7. Loud voice. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Heard that? Read it again. Listen. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. What does that mean? There's a woman who will give birth to a son and give birth before she goes into labor and have any pain. Where was that fulfilled? Who fulfills that prophecy in Isaiah? Mary. No one except Mary. It's a dogma of the church that Mary was a virgin before, during, and after giving birth. During giving birth. So the birth of Jesus that we just read here in Luke is a miraculous birth. Now, we don't get that sense just from reading Luke. What we have from Luke, she gave birth to a firstborn son. That's happened many times before. Wrapped in swaddling clothes many times before. Placed in a manger, not so, probably never happened before, but it's happened here. But that's not miraculous, etc. But when we go to Isaiah 66, 7, we have a prophecy about a woman who's going to give birth to a son and give birth before she has any labor pains. Who fulfills that, as I said already? No one else. Uh, that could only relate to the Virgin Mary giving birth to Christ. Okay? Um, there are many who laugh at this dogma, including Catholics. They probably laugh more than some Protestants do about this. But it's there. Very good. All right. Verse 8. And in the region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Now, shepherds were very despised. They were the lowest, considered the lowest of the lowest. They were considered un, unclean, uncouth, uneducated, accursed, etc. cetera. Um, but it's, well, we have a consistent theme here. Jesus is born in really lowly circumstances. The main and in place in the manger. Now, I should have mentioned most many commentators say 
this where they were was actually a cave carved out of rock uh, in which people shepherds took their animals and kept them there in case of bad weather or to protect them from the elements or whatever so we see here the the son of god the creator of the universe is born in the most um ex you know, extremely poor circumstances and is going to be visited by the lowest of the low the shepherds it's not the first time though that god favors shepherds i mean abel jacob joseph in the old testament moses david and amos were all shepherds as well okay so there's something consistent there god reveals himself through shepherds and is doing so again here out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night now just the point about when was jesus born what day of the year i remember when i was very young getting scripture in a public school we were taught that jesus wasn't really born december 25 this is something jehovah witnesses and others go on about <laughs> wasn't born on december 25 this is a pagan festival you know it's blah 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 and all that etc etc and i came to believe or well, maybe okay December 25 is just a liturgical feast. It's something the church has chosen as a date to, you know, to celebrate the birth of Christ. I mean, the birth of Christ is celebrated in scripture. We're going to see it here. The angels appear, they're singing, they're celebrating. So if the angels could celebrate the birth of Christ, we can celebrate, celebrate the birth of Christ. There's nothing wrong with celebrating the birth of Christ. When Christ was born, well, that's that's incidental. It's it's not that critical. He was born. We know that. Was it December twenty five? Maybe, maybe not. But when you read the ancient church fathers, like Saint John Chrysostom and Saint Augustine, they're emphatic. Jesus is born December twenty five. The argument is: Well, Jesus couldn't have been born in the northern hemisphere winter. You got shepherds out there, okay, in the field, keeping watch over their flocks. That doesn't happen in winter. It's too cold for their flocks to be out in the open at that time of the year. No, it's not. I've been to the Holy Land during winter. I've been to the Holy Land during the middle of summer and the middle of winter and in springtime. And let me tell you something. When you travel from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's the same Bedouins that are out there every day, every week and every month of each year. Right? They haven't changed. The Bedouins are still there like they were 2,000 years ago or longer. They're out there in the fields with their goats, with their sheep. Doesn't matter if it's winter or summer. Their winters now are like Sydney winters. You're in Jerusalem during December, January. It's 15 to 17 degrees Celsius. It's not that cold. Huh? So there's no, these arguments from weather or climate that Jesus wasn't born December 25, it's just not, doesn't register. They're not serious arguments. All right. An angel of, of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they are filled with fear. Now, this concept, again, what we're having here, the glory of the Lord, that is a technical phrase. This is the term I've used before. You've heard me say it before, the Shekhinah. That's the glory. Shekinah Kabod, the, the, the presence of the glory. Now, as I've said before, and we're going to come back to this, and this is very critical here in this chapter, the glory of the Lord dwelt with the Israelites. We saw him walking with the Israelites in the days of Moses, speaking to Moses through the burning bush, walking with the Israelites through the Sinai, being with the Israelites in the days of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies, enthroned above the Ark of the Covenant, cloud by day, fire by night, and the dedication of the temple by Solomon, descending from heaven, consuming the sacrifices, and then entering the Holy of Holies and filling the temple. And again, cloud by day, fire by night, residing, enthroned over the Ark of the Covenant. And this glory remained with the Israelites right through unto the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And I, as I told you, I think last week, Ezekiel, when in exile in Babylon, he had the vision. He saw the glory depart 
depart really in disgust from the corruption of, of the priesthood in the temple, leave the temple, go to this mountain in the east and ascend into heaven from this mountain in the east. The glory departed, that's the term Ichabod. You, in some American Protestants, they name their children Ichabod. Ichabod Crane. You've heard of the term Ichabod Crane? Ichabod is the opposite of Carbod. Carbod is presence. Ichabod is the departure of the presence, right? The presence departed. Well, we're at a point now where the presence is about to return. And we get a glimpse of it here with the angels. And when they appear, the glory of God is apparent around them. And the angel said to them, be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will come to all the people. To all the people, not just the Jews. They don't pick this up yet. The, probably the shepherds, when they hear this, think all the people mean the Jews, okay? But all the people. For you, for to you is born this day in the city of David a saviour who is Christ the Lord. Very specific, very Christian language. Saviour. Well, how they have un would have understood the term saviour? The shepherds hearing that. Oh, save us from the Romans. Save us from misery. Save us from enslavement. Save us from the pagans and their false religions. Well, for us, in retrospect, it means saviour from sin. Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. So when he, when, okay, it wouldn't have been said in Greek originally, but uh, the Messiah, they would have understood Christ here to mean the Messiah. And they've been waiting for the Messiah for centuries. And then the Messiah who is the Lord. Remember, in this context, everywhere where Lord is mentioned in Luke, it relates only to God. Okay, so looking in backwards here as Christians interpreting what the angels are telling the shepherds here, okay, Christ, the Messiah, Mashiach, as they would have said it, the, uh, the shepherds would have understood that term as Mashiach, right? This Messiah has come who's going to save the world and is going to be the Lord in human form. And this will be a sign for you you'll find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So that's why Luke gave us that detail a little while ago, because they're the specific instructions that the angel gives to the shepherd. You're going to find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Well, that's okay, but still in the clothes and lying in a manger. Well, that's how many infants in Bethlehem at this time are going to be in both in swaddling clothes and in a manger? Very few. So there's specific instructions to help the shepherds find this child. And suddenly there was an angel, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host. Now, and the Greek word there is strategoi, which means we get strategy from strategoi. So we strategize in order to have things in order. So they, the angels appeared in a military order praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And that's where we get this Christmas carol from, Gloria in Excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And there's various translations here. Peace among men of goodwill or to men goodwill. There's various translations, okay? Um, why do we have various translations? because sometimes the Greek words can have more than one meaning or sometimes the different manuscripts actually that we have, the copies of copies of copies, portray the text slightly differently. Okay. Um, the, the Christ doesn't come to, to the earth just to give peace to people who are already in good standing with God. So this translation, in my view, uh, and among men with whom he is pleased, the translation, uh, and to men goodwill, probably is the better suited one. God is showing goodwill to everybody, whether they're good willed themselves or not. Christ is coming into the world as saviour to save sinners. 
not just the good, right? So this is a good will to send the Messiah um, and to establish the Messianic peace. This is not the peace of Augustus or the peace of the Roman Empire, the Pax Roman. This is a, the authentic peace of one who is in good standing, you know, this is what's offered to the whole world. The peace that one has when they are in good standing with God, sonship, friendship with God. That's been offered to everybody, the good and the bad. It's up to the bad to accept that offer. Okay. Right. When 15, verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made, made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Okay, we're all familiar with that. And when they saw it, they made known the saying which had been told them concerning this child. So. The shepherds then related to Our Lady and St. Joseph what they had just seen or what they had heard. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Verse 19, but Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. So it's a very significant statement. The shepherds have come, just imagine, they've seen the angel, then they saw the angels and they heard the you know, the celebration. That's the first Christmas celebration, by the way. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. That's the first Christmas party. The angels celebrated, as I said, and so we can. So next time the Jehovah Witnesses knock on your door and say that Christmas is pagan, just say, well, the angels celebrated the first Christmas. Like, it doesn't matter what day of the week it was. By the way, I should mention... 25th of December was a major feast for pagans, right? Various ancient civilizations celebrated some type of festival on that day because it's all related to the solstices and the equinoxes. You have to understand December 21 in the Northern Hemisphere is the shortest day of the year for the length of sunlight. So it's the darkest day. It's the day when the sun dies in a sense, whatever religion you follow. The Druids in, in, in Britain or the, you know, the Romans had Saturnalia, et cetera, et cetera, all right? So December 25 was celebrated because in the ancients saw that was the first day after December 21 when the, le the length of daylight began to increase again. So it was the day of the rebirth of the sun. So they celebrated a feast on December 25. Oh, daylight is lengthening again. The sun has come back to life, right? So it's really no coincidence that the, you know, God would deign that the son of God would be born on that day to substitute and to celebrate that in substitution of celebrating the rebirth of pagan gods. And the early Christians knew this and they saw this. And that's why even if Jesus wasn't born on December 25, it was appropriate to place the celebration of his birth on that day to substitute. This is what we call baptizing a pagan feast day and making it a Christian feast day to celebrate the birth of the true God rather than the rebirth of any false God etc all right now when people are hearing what the shepherds are relating oh they're excited and they're talking about it mary's reaction is that she pondered them in her heart she's gaining a deeper appreciation of everything that's happening the annunciation the conception of christ carrying christ now giving birth to him the significance of, you know, the conception by the Holy Spirit. She's carrying the Son of God, Son of the Most High. And she's still herself growing in realisation and appreciation of the significance of all this. It also tells us she kept all these things in her heart, pondering them, but keeping them, because she is the original source of all this. Mention that again. Said it in the first session and in the second session. How do we know any of this? It's because Mary kept it in her heart and then later related it to others. 
and someone wrote it down well before Luke wrote it down. Luke can't write it down. He was not there. He wasn't even a Jew. He wasn't even one of the apostles. So he's writing more than 60 years after this happens. So how can he write it down? He either knew Mary, met her, recorded notes if he interviewed her, right? He could have done that. Someone did it. Or he inherited, he came across, he collected such testimonies from Mary. Imagine this yourself. Imagine it's the year 48. And you're a Christian and you're living around Jerusalem. And you've heard that Mary has come back to Jerusalem with St. John. She's been living in Asia Minor in Ephesus for many a year and she's returned. Wouldn't you as an ardent uh, believer in Jesus Christ be excited about that? When can we see Mary? I mean, we've got Cardinal Pell here in Sydney and there's so many people lining up wanting to see him. Okay, and with all respect, Cardinal Pell is not the Blessed Virgin Mary, all right? And he'll be the first to admit that, right? If we've got people lining up to want to see the Cardinal, wouldn't we have had Christians wanting to line up to see Mary? And of course, I doubt that people could just turn up and knock on her door and welcome themselves into her house. She would have been protected in a sense. She would have had an entourage around her that would have you know, manage access to her. But she would have wanted, she would have wanted to be accessible to people. So there would have been Christians of all types wanting to sit and have a conversation or pray with men. And some of them would definitely have talked to her. She would have answered their questions. They would have written down those answers. And they have been asking her, what was it like when the angel visited you? What was it like when Jesus was born? What was it like when you were, when he was growing up in the household with you and Joseph, all that? And of course, we only have the highlights package here. Four Gospels together give us what percentage of the overall picture? One percent? Even less, perhaps. There's so much in Luke. If Luke didn't write this gospel, we wouldn't have had any of the canticles of the Magnificat, right? The Benedictus, or the Nunc Dimittis we're going to look at tonight. And half a dozen other parables and miracles as well that are only related in Luke's gospel. So what did Jesus say or do which was spectacular or stupendous or profound that we don't know about because it's not written in any of the Gospels. And I can say that with great confidence because John in his Gospel in chapter 20 says that, says that if everything Jesus said and did was put down in writing, we wouldn't have enough books in the world to contain it. It's a hyperbole. It's a greatly exaggerated hyperbole, but it makes the point. The four Gospels, his Gospel and the other three that he was aware of, contain very little of what actually Jesus did and said in the totality. All right. And the shepherds, verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. All right. Any comments or questions at this stage? I'm halfway through it. Yeah. I was saying that it is possible that Luke's collected his writings from people that have possibly interviewed and why not. Was he, would you say he was learned in, in, the, in the Jewish faith as well to get all these sort of opportunities? Yeah, this is interesting. Some people speculate that Luke was one of the people who met Mary and interviewed her himself. We're not sure exactly when Luke was converted. Well, we can get clues from the Acts of the Apostles because he associates initially with St. Paul. Like all converts, if, if Luke is converted in the... Now, Paul's journeys begin A.D. 45. 
So there's not much wiggle room there if Mary's assumed into heaven around AD 50. But we, as, I, as I've said many times, we're not exactly sure. We just don't know. But I still leave open the possibility that Luke converts to Christianity. He's really passionate and enthusiastic about it. And because he's highly educated and intelligent, he's got connections, namely Theophilus, he wants to write something for Theophilus, which will go to other people eventually as well. And, you know, he could have made his way to be and interviewed Mary himself. You know, that's the opinion of the of many in the in over the centuries. It's a pos, it's a po significant possibility. As well, he's and he says at the beginning of his gospel, he collected other sources. He did research as well, which implied that in addition to perhaps meeting Mary, he sourced he did source Mark's gospel. He did source another document that embedded in his gospel that's also embedded in Matthew's gospel. Okay, and you know, and he's got a, a lot of other original material as well. I mean, let's face it, how does he get to embed the prayers of the Nunc Dimittis and the and the you know Benedictus? I mean, they weren't Mary's prayers. So Mary must have had an extraordinary memory to be able to relate those prayers in detail and then put in writing and eventually enter into you know Luke's gospel. Now, Mary didn't have original sin, so maybe she had a very acute memory, right? Yes. Are you saying that Luke never met Mary, or what are you referring to? That who never met Mary? Luke. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, I don't know. No one knows for certain. Yeah, we should know, because he was the first one to draw Mary as an Well, that's, that's a tradition. And it's, it's a small T tradition, however. It could even be a legend. Now, when I say legend, I don't mean something that is probably false. It is a pious story, but the historicity of it, the historical foundations of it are not certain. It's a pious belief. It's a worthwhile belief. It's a meritorious belief. Uh, but And what you're saying is true. There is that tradition that he painted Mary, gave us a first portrait. Well, for Luke to know that in the beginning of his gospel, it speak on Mary, of she and the angel, he had to know he would have met Mary for sure. Yeah, look, what you're saying is a possibility. We can't say for sure, because Luke, I'm saying it's great to believe that Luke met Mary and interviewed Mary. It's fantastic. I want to believe that too. But we don't know for certain, right? It's probable, but we don't know for certain, okay? If you want to believe it, I encourage you to believe it. I'm certainly not going to discourage you because I don't know for sure. But I believe it because if uh, Paul wanted to go to Damascus, to destroy the Christianity, the first thing he had to kill is Mary. Well, there's no record that he came after Mary, uh -huh. but he came after many, but he didn't succeed in getting Mary anyway, even if he did come after Mary. Okay, let's move on now. Verse 21, at the end of, and at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. Now, we already looked at the circumcision of John the Baptist. So remember, circumcision is critical for Judaism. Circumcision goes back to the days of Abraham, commanded by Yahweh, it's recorded in Genesis 17. What's the significance of circumcision? It formally incorporated the child into the covenant relationship between Yahweh and the Israelites. It was a form of baptism in a sense, right? So you did not have the you did not have the status of being a Hebrew, let alone a Jew, let alone the Messiah, if you were not circumcised. Did Jesus need to be circumcised? The answer is no, but he had to fulfill it. All due observance, otherwise he would not have. If he wasn't a circumcised Jew, he would not have been accepted by anyone. He would have he would have been totally disqualified for uh, for any claim to be the Messiah. Now. Circumcision here, in the case of Jesus, is occurring in maybe in the cave where Jesus was born, or maybe now they've moved to a house, a more regular house, 
the person who circumcises is normally the father or a priest who's brought in to do that. And there'll be 10 witnesses at least. And it's not in the temple? No, the presentation's in the temple. We're coming up to that very quick. Circumcision was always done in the home of the father. Okay, it's the naming ceremony and the father names the child. And it's, a, it's that right that incorporated the child into the formal people of God, the Abrahamic covenant. Now, and that, okay, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, you all know what Jesus means, don't you? Yahweh saves, okay? And he wasn't called Jesus. No one called him Jesus when he was in Nazareth. Right? They called him Yeshua. How do we get Jesus from Yeshua? Because when they transliterated the Hebrew for Yeshua into Greek letters, it, be it became Jesus. Similar. You're saying it more in Arabic, I think. Right? And when you look at the Greek, Jesus, the letters, you can understand how those letters are then transliter transliterated into the English letters that make Jesus. Then, but as I said, when he's in, in his time as a young boy growing up, whether it's Bethlehem, Nazareth, or any other place, he was Yeshua, Joshua, Yahweh saves. Okay. Now, verse 22, and when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses. Now, Protestants seize on this verse and say, you see, here's evidence that Mary wasn't immaculately conceived. She was a sinner. She owns up to it because she goes. Now, Jesus is 40 days old now. She goes to present Jesus in the temple and she goes to be purified. And she's admitting to being a sinner. But look, but look what Luke said, their purification. Who's there? Mary and Jesus. They both needed purification. So if the Protestant argument is right, then it applies to Jesus as well. He needed purification. He was a sinner as well. So if he's a sinner, how can he be the Messiah? Doesn't make sense. All right, let's look at this and give the Catholic understanding. What's happening here is that Luke uses one term to describe two ceremonies that are happening. Mary is going to be purified, but from a this is a legal requirement. She has the law as it stood. When a woman gave birth, here it's her firstborn son. She is legally impure for 40 days. She can't touch any holy object. She's forbidden the temple for 40 days. That's where we get the term quarantine from. 40 days forbidden in isolation. At the end of the 40 days, she must go to the temple with her firstborn son. And two things are happening. She's being purified of this legal impurity. There's no moral impurity here. It's just simple legal status. You have born a child. You are legally impure until you go to the temple, go through a, a ceremonial washing called the mikvah, and then make the sacrifices in the temple. Well, Mary's doing that. Why? Not because she's admitting she's a sinner, but to observe all due observance. Your, your question. Um, isn't that, that's not like yeah, that's true. But this isn't a baptism, okay? The washing ceremony wasn't a baptism. It was a symbolic washing. It didn't actually wash. Okay, now, I'll, in a moment, I just want to finish this because I, I, I don't want to lose my train of thought. This is rather complicated. So there's two ceremonies happening here, but Luke puts them under one title, the purification. So for Mary to be purified, she has to go to the temple uh, on 40 days after giving birth. She goes through the ceremonial washing and she offers a sacrifice. She must offer sacrifice of a pigeon, a turtle dove. That's why they sold animals in the temple precinct. That's why later on Jesus gets the whip and casts and knocks down and 
etc because they are, those people were selling animals but ripping off people all right she also has to do a second sacrifice one the first pigeon or turtle dove is for her purification the second one is a sacrifice in thanksgiving for having the gift being given the gift of a child if they were well off mary would have purchased a spotless lamb one year of age and that would have been sacrificed in thanksgiving but because they weren't so well off they offered a second turtle dove a second pigeon so one sacrifice for her purification, the second dove sacrifice in thanksgiving for the gift of the child. And that was the purification ceremony. Then they had a second ceremony, the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple. Now, Jesus is a Jew. He's not a Levite. Before the sin of the golden calf back in the days of Moses, all the firstborn males were you know, whatever tribe were designated to be priests. But because of the sin of the golden calf and only the Levites did not commit that sin, all the other tribes were stripped of their priesthood and the priesthood was, was reserved to the males of the Levite tribe. So Jesus is brought to the temple as a Jew, not as a Levite, and he's presented to the priest but he's not consecrated as a priest because he's not a Levite. So from Jesus, so for Mary and Joseph to get Jesus back, they have to redeem him and they pay a sacrifice of five shekels. But Jesus, in any case, he didn't have to go through any of this. Neither did Mary. Mary wasn't impure in any way, shape or form. It, and the law in Leviticus 12 for the purification only related to women who received man seed. Mary didn't receive man's seed. Her con the conception of Christ in her womb was by the Holy Spirit. So she was exempt from the Leviticus, the rule, the law in Leviticus 12 in any case. And as for Jesus, the, you know, the presentation of the infant's firstborn was a rule, the law under Exodus 13. Well, Jesus didn't have to be presented either because he was a priest anyway. He didn't need to be redeemed. He was a priest, but not of the Levitical priesthood of the order of Melchizedek, a more ancient perpetual line of priesthood. And Jesus is still the high priest of that, of the order of Melchizedek. And our Catholic priests today in this parish and all other Catholic churches are priests of the order of Melchizedek, not alternative or additional priests to Christ, but participating in the priesthood of Christ. All right. Uh, let's just see if I've covered all that. All right, there was a question here. Why, um, why was, were the women considered unclean because they were not having a baby? I'll tell you something that make you even more uncomfortable. <laughs> if she gave birth to a boy, her quarantine was 40 days. If she gave birth to a girl, her quarantine was 80 days. <laughs> don't ask me why. Don't. don't. <laughs> This is the 21st century, and I get in enough trouble already, all right? That I, I need to do further study. Look, there's something about menstruation, shedding blood. These were, I don't yet understand why they considered that that made the woman ritually impure, okay? I, and I have to admit that, all right? I can understand the sacrifice by, that was done the second pigeon the second turtle dove in thanksgiving fully understand all right yeah just like say that again yes yeah oh as far as i know no he didn't have to go through this well from what i can my guess is the answer is no he's not considered impure why because no, there's no requirement that he has to do anything okay. don't ask me why if, as my 21st century mindset say oh this is very sexist well we can't impose our mindsets of today on the culture and the laws of that time they are following the laws of moses which were very prescriptive very tight right very detailed. We're happy that these laws don't exist today, right? There's plenty of laws that the Jews had 
we don't have today and and for good reason and thankfully. All right, now, where are we? So, okay, I'm coming up to Simeon in verse 25. But before that, I want you to understand that what's happening here with the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple is a restoration is the completion of the temple. Now, temples destroyed 587 BC. The, the Jews are allowed under Cyrus to, the Persians destroy the Babylonians in 539 BC. The Babylonians are swallowed by the Persians. The Persians were less, less ruthless than the Babylonians, who were slightly less ruthless than the Assyrians before them. So the enlightened Cyrus the Great allows the Jews to, if they wish, to go back to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, and rebuild. So they start rebuilding the temple. When they, the, the building of the second temple in the days of Zerubbabel and the rebuilding of the walls in the days of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the observance of the law in the days of Ezra, when the, when the second temple is being rebuilt, all those old men who could remember the original temple when they were little boys were crying and saying that the second temple is totally inferior compared to the first temple. Fast forward many centuries. In this period, Herod the Great was a monumental builder. And one of his projects to please the Jews was to augment the whole te temple precinct. And this was a project that took 46 years. And it was still largely unfinished when Jesus is presented in the temple at the age of 40 days. But this is when the second temple is complete. Because the second temple had two very critical elements missing. Unlike the first temple, there was no ark and even worse, there was no glory presence of God in the Holy of Holies. When did the second temple get its ark and get its glory presence? At the presentation. When Mary arrived carrying Jesus, she was acting as ark. And Jesus is the glory, not as fire, not as cloud, but now in human flesh. So the, yeah, Jesus is Shekinah. Shekinah Kabbalah, he's the glory presence among humanity now, or then, in, in human form. And the imagery is complete. Mary was uh, carrying the Messiah and now was acting as throne, having the Messiah in her arms when she brings him to the temple. Christ is the glory of God present among us now. This moment, this event completes the temple. Okay. Whatever they do in the next 30-odd years or right through the AD 70 when the Romans destroy the temple is nothing compared to this moment. All right. Now there was a man, verse 25, in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, there's a legend here, a friend of mine related to this to me the other day, that Simeon was hundreds of years of age. You don't have to believe this. Right? And Simeon was one of those men back in the third century who translated the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek, but he got one word wrong. And so he was given a punishment. He was going to not die until the Messiah would come. Some would say that's not a punishment, but, you know, he's a very old man now. And, but I don't necessarily, I don't believe this legend, but it's a nice story, okay? And now it's finally come where this Simeon is going to be released and he will see the Messiah, and then he cries out to God, now you can take me. So what do we read here? And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, now... 
let your servant depart in peace according to your word. So now, God, let me die. Right? You made me wait until this moment, and this moment has come. <laughs> For my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, these words of the Nunc Dimittis tell us of a Simeon who knows his scripture very well, particularly the book of Isaiah. Right? So, my eyes have seen your salvation. So that's a reference to Isaiah 40, 46, and 52, understanding that the Messiah will be a person who brings salvation. And this in the spiritual sense, not salvation, deliverance from Roman rule, but salvation in the sense of liberation from sin, etc., which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. So again, Simeon has this expansive view of the mission of the Messiah, not limited military kingly figure coming to liberate the Jews, but a Messiah who will be coming to liberate us from sin and all peoples from sin. Verse 32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, Isaiah 42 and 49. Now, this verse was used by Jews to support the popular view that the Messiah would be a military kingly figure who'd cast out the Romans, reunite the 12 tribes, and be enthroned on Mount Zion and reign undisturbed to the end of time. The rest of the world will come to know the true God, Yahweh, through this glorious, victorious, messianic figure. Because it says so, he'll be a light to the Gentiles. Right? So the Jews, and they weren't, I'm not criticizing them for having this view. It's easy to criticize them in hindsight. But from their genuine, sincere reading of Scripture, they held this limited view of the mission of the Messiah. The Messiah would be enthroned on Mount Zion, and that's how he would be the light to the Gentiles. Now, of course, I don't believe Simeon had that narrow view. He had more of the expansive view. The Messiah was going to come to liberate us, to free us from sin, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. And for the glory to your people Israel, Gentiles and Israelites. Verse 33. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. As I said, Mary understands better than anyone what this whole series of events means but she's still learning right she's still getting a deepening understanding of the significance of all this for her and the and what her child will eventually achieve and simeon blessed them and said to mary his mother behold this child is set for the fall and rising of many in israel does Mary know that already? I don't know. You can have opinions about that. Does Mary know that her son is going to divide Israel? Perhaps, perhaps not. I tend to favor the view that she would have had some inkling. But Simon has it as, Simeon has it as well. He's been given this as a gift, private revelation. He understands so much about the future with respect to this child. Jesus, the, who's going to be the Messiah. This child is going to divide Israel. Those who accept him, he doesn't say that they'll be the minority. Those who reject them, him, he doesn't say they're going to be the majority. Right? Fall and right, and a sign that is spoken against. Now, you're a mother, you don't want to hear that. Maybe Mary now is coming through these words to a realization that, yes, my son is the Messiah. He's going to do all these wonderful things, but he's not going to be, not necessarily going to be accepted by the majority of Jews. He's going to be spoken against. He's going to be rejected and it's going to get worse. Verse 35, and a sword will pierce through your own soul as well. Some translate it as heart. It's not. It's soul. Simeon, in saying that, that Mary is going to suffer, he's not saying that, meaning that literally, that Mary is going to literally have a sword pierce her soul. No. What, is, what Simeon is referring to is the piercing that Jesus is going to suffer. 
And that's going to spiritually pierce Mary. Mary will suffer tremendously in experiencing and seeing her own son physically pierced. So Simeon has an understanding of what the Messiah is going to go through. He's not going to be glorious and victorious in the worldly sense. He's going to be glorious and victorious in a higher sense, spiritual sense. But in the visible sense, he's going to be spoken against. He's going to be rejected. He's going to be pierced. He's going to suffer tremendously. And you, Mary, his mother, are going to suffer tremendously as well. Your soul will be pierced, meaning not your, not your you won't be pierced physically like your son, but you will suffer tremendously in seeing him physically suffer. And... That thoughts of many hearts may be revealed, right? The many hearts are going to be revealed, their thoughts, some in favor of Jesus as the Messiah, but mostly many against him. Verse 36. Just pause there for a second. Any comments or questions about any of that? So, yes. So did you say something on that revelation that there are these things happening? Absolutely. How could he speak this, any of these words, especially to Our Lady in St. Joseph, unless he had received this as a gift? How could he relate this? Where did he get it from? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Special revelation, private revelation, right? He doesn't get it from his own private reading of Scripture. He doesn't get it in conversations with priests and, you know, Pharisees and scribes. This has been revealed to him. This is very incisive and very acute understanding of the real mission of the Messiah. Yes. He knew the Old Testament and well, very well. For him, and even Mary knew the Old Testament too. That's true. That's true. He could know the Old Testament very well, but so did the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. So how did they get it wrong? Because there are verses that go both ways. You look at Isaiah 53, you, you read about the suffering servant, you know, he'd be like lamb to the slaughter. He won't utter any words. He'll stay silent throughout. Okay. Well, the Jews interpret that as a... As a in a figurative sense, it's that is not an actual individual person. That is Israel as a whole who will suffer as a suffering servant in the trials and tribulations that it will endure for the, over the centuries. You know, with particularly through foreign domination and pagan domination, etc. So, you know, again, if we're just left to our own devices to interpret in Scripture, we'll come to different conclusions. Okay. Simeon knew this not through his own personal study of Scripture. It was specifically revealed to him, yes, by the Holy Spirit, of course, privately. All right, verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna. There weren't many prophetesses in the Old Testament. She wasn't the first. There was other. Don't laugh. Okay. <laughs> the greatest prophet of the 20th century was the Virgin Mary at Fatima. She acted as a prophetess there, okay? Speaking to us about the will of God, calling us to repentance and warning of the consequences and making predictions of the future. That is the complete, that is the, being a prophet in the plenary sense, complete sense, right? in every aspect, in every sense. There's been Miriam, there's been Deborah, there's been Hulda before Anna. All right, you know, because in that culture, men weren't going to listen to women. Sorry for saying that, you know. Uh, so, who said there's authority figures to call men back to repentance, to fidelity? It has to be other men. But God often chose weak men, men who had many failings and weaknesses, but his strength was shown through them. Moses had a stutter. Jeremiah was just a teenager boy. Who's going to listen to him? Amos was a nobody shepherd. Who's going to listen to him? Okay. All right. So we have Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Now, Asher is one of the tribes that was destroyed by the Assyrians. There's only two tribes left in the south, Judah and Benjamin. But there were remnants. 
Okay, sure, the Assyrians captured these 10 tribes and scattered them to the other side of the Euphrates, but there were en enough individuals who escaped. All right. So of the tribe of Asher, and she was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity and as a widow till her 84. So she was 84. Now, that's one interpretation. The Greek here is again equivocal. So some have interpreted this to mean that Anna was married seven years, so she might have married at 14 or say 15, and she remained married until she was 22. Her husband dies, and then she's a widow for 84 years afterwards, which makes her around 106 now. That is highly improbable, but not impossible. What is more probable <clears throat> is that she's 84. Married at 15, <clears throat> widowed at 22, and remained so until, until she was 84. And to be 84 in that age is an enormous age in any case. The average age of people in the first century is 42. She's lived double the average age. I mean, if you live to 84 today, you've done well. All right? So live to 84 in those days, you've done incredibly well. All right. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day, which means that she was regularly in the temple, religiously in the temple living the life what we would, of, of a religious celibate, praying every day, fasting regularly. She would have had a, a regular re, a regular pattern. She would have had a regime, specific regime that she followed privately in her own spiritual life. And coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to God and spoke of him to all who are looking for the redemption of Israel. I like to see a movie which depicts this as a scene. An old woman, very pious, very prayerful, 84 years of solid piety, prayer and fasting, you know, wrapped up tightly like a woman would have been in those days. And then when she sees, she again, this is private inspiration given to her by God. She recognizes, like Simeon, you know, that the Messiah has come into the temple and how she would have spoken out loud, rejoicing uh, and to any all and sundry who came to her or near her at that moment in the temple. All right, very joyous moment. But more significant, or not more significant, but very curious is verse 39 to 40. And we'll finish with this. We're doing well. We did start late. Um, and when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, so when all due observance was complete from our lady in St. Joseph, and we know they've done the circumcision of Christ, they have now done the purification of Mary, they've done the presentation of the infant Jesus. It's over now, these observances. So they're in Jerusalem. Where are they going to go back? Go back first to Bethlehem and perhaps stay there, or then go back to Nazareth. What Luke says here, they returned into Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. What's the problem with that verse? Hmm? There's nothing wrong with that. You'd hope so, wouldn't you? Some translations have it slightly different. And he grew in wisdom before God and man. So some people imply, well, if he's growing in wisdom, he wasn't really eternal wisdom. Because if you're eternal wisdom, you can't be growing in wisdom. But what's happening with Jesus? Jesus acted, ordinarily, he acted his age. So when he's one, he acts like a one-year-old. He's not teaching in the temple as a one-year-old. He does give us an exception when he's 12. When he's in the temple, he is asking questions and giving answers that just bewilder those around him. And they're wondering, well, where did this child get all this? He's not enrolled in any of our schools, okay? So ordinarily Jesus acted his age, but as Jesus grew, he manifested increasing signs of wisdom and piety, naturally. But that's not the issue here. That's not in con contesting. What is wrong with what Luke says in verse 39? What's missing? 
It's talking about baby Jesus. It's not talking man, man Jesus. It's talking about infant, a, a baby. Okay. What I'm trying to get at is that Matthew mentions many things that Luke doesn't. What doesn't Luke mention? These are huge things. Think of Christmas. Think of it. The wise men. Where's the star of Bethlehem? Where's the wise men? Where's their visit to Jerusalem? Where's their encounter with Herod the Great? Where is the wise men coming and offering the Holy Family the three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Where is the angel talking to the wise men to head off back home and not return to Herod the Great? Where is the mention of Herod the Great coming to destroy the Holy Family? Where is the mention of the angel Gabriel telling the Holy Family to escape to Egypt? Right? Where is the mention of them coming back out of Egypt, fulfilling a prophecy and doing that, going back to Bethlehem and then deciding now Archelaus is in charge. We had to, got to go back to Nazareth. When you read Luke, Luke just gives us the impression they do the ceremonies and go back to Nazareth. <laughs> There's years of events between fulfilling the law in the temple and heading back to Nazareth. So what's the solution? The very solution. Is there contradiction here? No, no. There's not. There is apparently. On the face of it, there's grave contradiction. But either we have these scenarios. One, Luke knows all about the material in Matthew, but doesn't record it because he doesn't see the need to because Christians already have that in Matthew's gospel. Right? That's scenario one. Scenario two is that he never knew about Matthew's gospel or had it been written yet. And he didn't know about those events, which is why he doesn't mention them. In any case, the end result's the same. Whether they go to Egypt or not, they end up back in Nazareth. And that's the point of Luke. He's born in Bethlehem, fulfills the prophecy in Micah, and then and he ends up back in Nazareth, and that's how he becomes known as a Nazarene. The third scenario, which is utterly unacceptable, but common among modernist critics today, is that Matthew is a liar. And none of the events he relates really happened. He faked it so that he can give the impression to his Jewish audience who he's writing for that Jesus fulfills these prophecies about the star, the, the, the kings and that who come from Sheba and Saba and acknowledge him and, you know, and the prophecy in Jeremiah, you know, uh, a cry was heard in Rama, lamentation and great weeping. It was Rachel weeping for her children and she would not be comforted because none were left. That's a prophecy that Matthew himself embeds in his gospel, fulfilled by the slaughter of the innocents, okay? Now, that third scenario is typical of modernist critics today who say that much of the New Testament, the Gospels, is a fabrication. So I just toss that out the window. But I don't know what to make of this gap that Luke has created here. Why Luke mentions none of those events. You'd think that if he did know Mary, and took data from Mary that this, the, those events are extremely important and should have been mentioned, right? Of the three scenarios, if I had to choose one of them, it's probably the first one. Luke knew of those events, but just felt he, no need to embed it in his gospel because it was already in a well-known gospel and known to Christian. And he was just being brief here. In this instance, he was... He gives us other material. His focus is to give us other material that's not in Matthew's gospel, not necessarily to repeat material that's in Matthew's gospel. It's like John when he writes his gospel. His main aim is to give us material that's not in the other gospel. So that's how I explain it. If you read that, and I would have read that 45 times in the past, and I would never have realized that Luke has created this con apparent contradiction with Matthew. He doesn't, the Holy Family doesn't go back to Nazareth. They go back to Bethlehem. 
And from Bethlehem, they fled to Egypt. So it's an obvious contradiction. Not really. We use our modern day critiquing techniques or literary senses today and impose that on writers of the past. Luke, as I said, probably knows all of those events, but just goes straight to it and they went there and they eventually came back to Nazareth. So it's the same conclusion in Luke 2 that we find in Matthew 2. All right. Finish there. Um, if there's any comments or questions, we've got a couple of minutes. The, the fact that, um, okay. yeah, please, yeah. The fact that um, Simeon said to Mary that uh, um, something would pierce her heart, but he didn't actually address it to Joseph. Is that to know that Joseph wouldn't be around? Yeah, that, that's that's a very good conclusion. Uh, sometimes I'm a little bit humorous about Luke and St. Joseph's role because St. Joseph in no gospel says anything. That's why he's the patron saint of perfect husbands. <laughs> that's my joke. All right. But only for women. Only for women, right? Uh, that's a joke. Leave that aside. But in Luke's gospel, he gets even, if I dare say, I'm being humorous here, pious humor. He gets even Aurora deal. He doesn't even appear. Okay. Oh, he does, sorry. But he he um he yeah, well, poor old poor old, um in these events, in the in the first part, in so much of it, Joseph is very much just sidelined. So we get Joseph mentioned here in chapter two, of course, but in, yeah, he gets, it's almost as if he's just an auxiliary, you know, doesn't say anything, disappears out of the scene. We don't even know how he disappears, no mention of it. But of course, do we know how old Joseph was when he disappeared? The only thing I've read is in the Catholic Encyclopedia, the old one, 1911 version, which says that he dies around the year AD 17. So Jesus would be around 20 years of age at the time. Where they get that number from, they, it's not explained. Who knows? You go to Nazareth, you've got the main basilica there of the Annunciation. You got just up from that, there's a small church, very beautiful church, dedicated to St. Joseph. And there's this beautiful artwork of St. Joseph on his deathbed with Jesus and Mary on either side. So we have St. Joseph as the patron saint of a happy death. And St. Joseph looks very old in that picture. So, how old is Joseph in these events? We only speculate. There's speculation. And I don't accept this, but there's pious traditions that he was married before. The brothers and sisters of Jesus are children of St. Joseph of that previous marriage. Um, that's not my argument for who the brothers and sisters of Jesus are. Uh, they are. They're first cousins. They're the children of Alpheus married to Mary, who's the sister of the Virgin Mary, meaning sister-in-law. Because when you look at Hegesippus, the first historian of the mid-second century, he says that Alpheus was the brother of St. Joseph. So that's why John calls Mary married to Alpheus, the sister of Mary married to St. Joseph, their sister's in-law. And the Jesus chooses brothers to be his a, a disciple, that James the Less and Jude are Jesus' first cousins, but they're not the children. They're not his brothers in the sense of children of St. Joseph. They're the children of Alphys, the brother of St. Joseph. All right. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. They say St. Joseph was possibly married before. Didn't St. Joseph also take the oath of circumcision? Yeah. So this is, we know none of that from the Gospels. We know that from a book called Proto-Evangelium of St. James. Again, mid-second century. 
that Mary, and this is a very strong tradition, Mary wanted to remain a virgin all her life. She was arranged to be married after spending 10 years in the temple. The priest did not accept the validity of her private vow of virginity because it wasn't a customary thing that Jews did. <laughs> Jews were more about getting married, having children for God, increasing the people of God naturally through childbirth. So things like consecrated celibacy, virginity was just not on the radar. So the priest went ahead to arrange Mary's marriage and to do it by lot. And according to this book, and this is where it gets complicated, we don't know what to believe exactly, Joseph, being previously married and much older, his name is pulled out to marry the Virgin Mary, and he is willing to accept remaining celibate and respecting Mary's private vow of perpetual virginity because he's old and he's not interested in that stuff anymore, right? So, well, that's not what Paul was told that yeah. Saint Joseph was weak to to marry Mary from his step from, from yeah, step. as I said, had his step in in the temple overnight, and that's they're, the and they're a different tradition, and you ha it's 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 good to believe that, and as I said, I don't know what to believe exactly because we just don't know precisely all the details, okay. We don't know. Yes. Um, Jay mentioned the references to Isaiah. Um, there's also other references in regards to Mary's virginity from Bethlehem. The male will be a son. Yeah. Yeah, that's Isaiah 7, right? The issue with Isaiah 7 is the word for virgin. Now, in the Hebrew, it's Alma, and that's equivocal because Alma means young woman. Now, ordinarily, young woman would mean virgin. In that time, certainly not now, right? Because we got we in the darkness of the sexual revolution now. But when the Old Testament was translated into Greek in the mid third century BC, the translators put the word Parthenon, sorry, Parthenos, which means virgin. Parthenos is more univocal, more specific. Yes, it is a young maiden, but it is a virgin young maiden. So the New Testament writers, Matthew in particular, when he embeds Isaiah 7 into his gospel as a prophecy that's fulfilled by the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, he's taking it and embedding it. He's taking the Greek version and embedding it into his gospel. Right. And so, OK, for the Christians, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. For the Jews, it's a young woman shall conceive and bear a son. So in the debates in second century Christianity versus Judaism, and this is where I've encountered this in the writings of St. Justin, writing, uh, relating his debate with Trypho, the Jew, debate he had with Trypho and his friends 30 years earlier. So Justin's writing around the year 160, recounting a debate he had around the year 135. And Trypho was pushing the view that this prophecy is not about the birth of Jesus. It's about the birth of the King Hezekiah. Right? And he was a righteous king, one of the few righteous kings of Judah. Okay, And, and his argument is, well, it doesn't, Alma doesn't mean necessarily a virgin means a young woman the christian view is that the, when they translated it in the greek they engaged in what was called dynamic equivalence they put a word that captured the original intent of the hebrew writer of isaiah which was and they and they knew and they they knew what the intent was by a tradition the tradition is well armor means it, that doesn't necessarily mean literally virgin but by custom we understand it to mean virgin so that's why they put parthenos and then so the christians when they got their new testament and they're quoting isaiah 7 they're quoting it in the greek and well what's miraculous about a, a young woman conceiving and bearing a son well it's beautiful it's wonderful but it's happened billions of times but how many how how many times has a 
virgin conceived and born a son. But when you say the young woman, you usually say the young woman as a very small woman, very young woman. She probably never had But what was young then? What was young? He said something small. Yeah, but... You're not saying a woman. We would consider girls now 13, 14, 15 as young and certainly not eligible for marriage. But in those days, it was time for marriage. Once menstruation began, they had become women. They didn't have this concept that we have now called teenagehood. This is a false modern concept of the of our age. Well, when you're right? talking about prophet saying the young woman, yes. I'm sure the prophet himself is not saying it as a woman who already had sexual yeah I, okay i agree with you and this was the traditional understanding of alma but when push comes to shove and apologetic debates you know and you want to deny jesus any chance of being eligible for them as the messiah and you want to debunk the possibility that it could relate to a virgin so you're going to fight the christians by giving an alternative interpretation of Okay, and many Old Testament prophecies only became much clearer in hindsight. And then we read that even with, for example, John talking about the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, quoting Zechariah 9, right? Well, the apostles themselves, John himself relates, we only, we only understood this in hindsight. Only after the resurrection did we realize the significance of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey and that that fulfilled Zechariah. Yes. So, so unrelated, but you can call me up, isn't it? Um, yeah. Like, who is he and like what's very mysterious figure? Like, He's very ancient. And we're talking about when we talk about Abraham, we're talking about the 21st century BC, early 21st century BC. So Melchizedek was already a very ancient, revered figure in the time of Abraham. There were no Jews then. Abraham wasn't a Jew. Abraham and his family were originally pagans from Chal Chaldea, you know, southern Iraq. All right, They're called, and from the seed of Abraham, you get the Israelites, and one tribe are the Jews. So Melchizedek is just, he's, he's a Gentile, but he's a worshiper of the true God. And he is offering sacrifice of bread and wine. And he's so revered by Abraham that Abraham gives him a percentage of his spoils that he won in battle. All right. Now, some speculate that, that Melchizedek was so old, he was actually Shem. All right. He survived many generations. Uh, he survived for, uh, I can't give you the exact number of years, but Shem is one of the sons of Noah. Noah, we relate, is about 3000 BC. Was he the youngest? Yeah, right. So Shem is, becomes Melchizedek, which, you know, which means king of righteousness. And it's that priesthood which subsists. And David, King David, was a priest in that, in that line of priesthood. How so? Because the descendants that line will descend, the righteous line will descend through Judah, right? And through into the Davidic line. Just like the, like the, the kids of the, uh, yeah, like the yeah, it's very complex. Don't put me on the spot here now. I can't give you specifics, but yeah. That's why it wasn't so outrageous for David to go into the temple and eat the bread that was for the priests only, because he was a priest himself, but not of the Levitical priest. Okay. All right, we'll finish there, okay? <laughs>